Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, HCV Utilization Webinar, Fair Market Rents. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. You can submit questions throughout the presentation to everyone from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the box provided and send. With that, I'll turn the call over to Stephen Durham, the Director of the Housing of the Director of the Office of Housing Voucher Program, excuse me. All right, thank you and good day to all that are uh, joining us today uh, for another installment in the HCV webinar series um, that's focusing on improving utilization in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. My name is Stephen Durham, I'm the Director of the Office of Housing Voucher Programs and as we are today's webinar will be focused on fair market rents. Next slide, please. And before we get into today's uh, presentation, a little quick housekeeping. Um, the webinar will be recorded as we usually do, and it will be available um, on our website at uh, www.hud.gov backslash HCV. Um, the associated PowerPoint will be available as well. You can look for those in about a week's time. As always, we are interested in hearing from you and how we could best help you guys uh, find efficiencies and maximize your HCV programs. So we're always uh, looking for additional HCV uh, utilization webinar topics that we can present on. So uh, please don't be shy, enter those uh, suggestions in the chat feature. Um, and we also have ability on our website, uh, take emails and you can submit them there as well. And, and lastly, uh, we always invite you guys to stay connected with the goings on of the program uh, by signing up for our HCV Connect newsletter. Um, it's one of the fastest growing newsletters out there uh, in this digital world, um, but we do have a quite a bit of information. We send that out um, monthly, and um, you can find all the kind of uh, happenings, occurrences, and the forthcoming events associated with the voucher program in the HCV Connect newsletter. It's a great resource, so if you haven't signed up, please do so. Next slide, please. Here you can see, here's today's agenda, um, and as you uh, read through the slides, the three uh, uh, sections of the presentation, a little context to what we're talking about today. Uh, the new 2023 FMRs were published on September 1st, 2022, with an effective date of October 1st, 2022. Uh, FMRs estimate the gross rent and the contract, which is the, excuse me, estimate the gross rent, which is the contract rent plus utilities that are paid by recent movers um, for standard quality units within a ge geographical market. The 2023 FMR estimates are about 10% higher on average than FMRs for fiscal year 2022. Some areas saw increases greater than 20%. The highlight of that, the importance of that is that higher FMRs can uh, potentially increase housing opportunities for your HCV families, and they can improve your HCV success rate for your PHA. So now we'll dive a little bit deeper into what the FMRs are, how they're calculated, and how your PHA can best uh, use the FMRs to help families in your local jurisdiction. This time I'm gonna hand it off to Adam Bibler, the Director of Program Parameters and Research Division within the Office of Policy Development and Research here at HUD. Adam, take it away. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to the PIH team for having me here today to talk about some of the technical aspects of fair market rents and the uh, new changes for FY 2023. As Stephen said, FMRs uh, inform the payment standards in the voucher program, which are of course very important when it comes to HCV utilization. So let's uh, dive right in. Um, let me see, there we go. So I'm gonna talk, uh, as I mentioned, about what's new for FY 2023, but I do wanna start with the background of where we were uh, going into this year uh, to make sure that everybody has the same, um, you know, background knowledge and we're all starting from the same place. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, those FY23 changes, the results of the actual numbers and put those into context and then, um, you know, finish up with some, some links and uh, then I'll turn it back over to PIH. Uh, 
So as Stephen already alluded to, fair market rents are the HUD's uh, best estimate of the gross rent for the more than 2,600 unique geographic market areas of the country. When we talk about gross rent, we're, of course, meaning the actual uh, rent for the shelter plus a utility portion. Um, and when we talk about this as referring to standard quality units, meaning it would pass the HQS inspection that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, and when we're interested in calculating these numbers, we want to look at the rent paid by recent movers. Um, so this is a measure that is supposed to reflect current market conditions, people who've moved into the unit recently, as opposed to being in place for a long time where those in-place tenants might have seen slower rent increases. Um, and as we've, as we've discussed, the FMR in turn the, informs the payment standard in the HCV program, but um, of course, it's just an aside, they're, they're used in other programs as well, everything from public housing to PBRA um, and so on. So uh, everything that we do, um, you know, it goes back to underlying statutes and regulations. Uh, as, we, as we'll talk about, we have changed some calculation methods, but there is an overarching framework that we still have to operate under based on HUD's um, statutes, which are, come from Congress and its regulations, which are on the books and HUD can change, but require going through rulemaking. So there's a lot of aspects uh, here that you can read through. The one that I will highlight that is under the regulatory side is that FMRs are currently calculated at the 40th percentile of gross rents from the distribution of units occupied by recent movers. So what does that mean? Uh, if you think about the average rent for a given area, that might be the mean. You could also think of the average as being the median for any particular market, which is the same as saying the 50th percentile rent. Here, we're actually setting the 40th percentile rent which is the point at which 40% of the units should be below the FMR and 60% should be above. So it's a metric which is by definition below average. I think that's a common misconception when you hear the term fair market rent that it implies that it's the average rent for a market. Uh, it's actually meant to be slightly below average and that's to maximize of course the number of households who ultimately get assistance because uh, this is not an entitlement program. And also, you know, we're interested in in uh, subsidizing a modest rental unit. There are, there are all kinds of amenities available in, in rent, rental housing and the 40th percentile is, is thought by HUD to be a, an appropriate metric. So as I discussed, there's more than uh, 2,600 areas, unique areas to the country. What determines an area? Well, this actually goes back to an official designation from the Office of Management and Budget of metropolitan statistical areas. So these might be one or more counties. I'm sure you're all familiar with your local metro areas and how they, they can uh, be, you know, cover a decent chunk of different counties. Um, but we do differ from the official MSA definitions in certain cases. Um, the most, uh, you know, the biggest category of these are places like San Francisco, Oakland, or Dallas, Fort Worth, which are quite large MSAs that we have elected to break up into smaller, more meaningful submarkets. So keeping Oakland and San Francisco separate, Dallas and Fort Worth separate. But we also tend to um, limit the changes to these definitions. OMB periodically revises their definitions. And what happens is as metro areas get larger, you have outlying counties come into the metro area, and then a few years later they might drop out. So that could create some bad uh, situations for the uh, voucher program where an outlying county with lower market rents ends up having a higher FMR in one year, and then they get removed from the metro and would have a lower FMR. We've elected to kind of freeze those boundaries and say any new counties will be created or will not be added to metro areas and will stay their own FMR area, and that's the terminology we use here is HUD Metro FMR areas. That also, that sort of philosophy also implies in New England, which are still based on older MSA boundaries, except that in, the, in that case, the um, counties might be split into different FMR areas and done on the basis of towns. I'm sure, you know, all of you have been working in the voucher program for some number of years are familiar with your own local areas, but if, you, if you've not ever heard the history or some of that, perhaps it's, it's useful to know.
Okay, so getting into the FMR methodology, and this is what would have been done in prior years, what we, we call, quote unquote, the typical methodology, which is still largely in place. It's just that how we are doing each of these steps has changed slightly. So it's still, it's still very important to understand what's happening here and some of the moving pieces. So what we do is we get a base rent estimate uh, coming from what's called the American Community Survey. That's the acronym ACS there, which is a product of the US Census Bureau. Basically every year, the Census Bureau surveys more than 3 million households, ask them economic and uh, demographic questions, and then can produce an estimate of rent for each geographic area as one of the questions is how much does this unit that you live in uh, rent for each month. So that gives us a measure of rent for every area of the country. We can also restrict the rent estimates to only look at recent movers because the survey also asks at what year did you move into your current address. So we can look at the rent specifically for people who've moved into the past one or two years. Uh, and so that gives us a dollar amount of recent mover rent that is as of the ACS year. And because there is a time lag between the ACS year and the present, we then apply inflation adjustments. And that inflation adjustment has historically been based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index for gross rents. So the combination of rent of primary residence and fuels and utilities. And so this is a similar data product in that the Census Bureau was surveying people about rents. Here, the BLS is surveying people about rents. The difference is that they have a fixed universe of rental units that they ask of their rent in consecutive periods over time. And then what they are producing is a price level. So it's the year to year change in rents as opposed to the dollar amount. But that gives us a growth factor that can be, be applied to the ACS estimates and inflate the rent through the present. And because we're calculating these uh, FMRs ahead of the fiscal year, we account for future inflation through the use of a trend factor, uh, which is the forecasted CPI um, growth based on an econometric model of time series uh, index levels. So I wanted to dwell on that a little bit. I think there's often, um, you know, because there are so many moving pieces here, there's often some misconceptions about the timing of the ACS estimates and how there is a data lag between each year of the ACS and when the FMRs are in effect. But uh, in every year, we have always been applying an inflation adjustment to those estimates, so they should be as of the current year. The question is really not about the time lag per se, but it's about how accurate are each of these adjustments, what are the strengths and limitations of each of these data sources, and, and, and so forth. So, let's go to the next slide. What happened for FY 2023? Well, there are two things that are related, but somewhat distinct. So, one is the cancellation, the effective cancellation of the 2020 one-year ACS estimates by the Census Bureau. And the other is high volatility in the rental housing market, as I'm sure everyone's familiar with. So what does that mean? So um, when I talked about the recent mover adjustment to the FMRs, that is, uh, as I said, a look at renters who've moved into their units within the past two years, which requires these estimates from the one-year ACS. The ACS comes in two flavors, annual averages, which is coming from the one-year S, and also five-year averages from the five-year ACS. So the way the ACS is conducted is that some of you might have even taken the survey. The Census Bureau periodically sends out uh, postcard size mailings to a random sample of households asking them to take the survey. But in, of course, in March of 2020, when COVID happened, they uh, were forced to shut down that operation, just like many workplaces in the United States were shut down. They couldn't send out the normal amount of um, surveys to households to then invite their response online. So that impacted the overall size of the sample. At the same time, they also couldn't send out field interviewers. Um, basically, if surveyed households do not complete their survey by online or by mail, 
a interviewer will come to your house and ask you the questions in person to make sure there's no what's called non-response bias. There's no bias introduced by people who refuse to take the survey. And of course, social distancing guidelines limited that aspect of data collection for part of 2020. So once they tabulated the results from their limited sample, they found that the, the overall results did not match their data quality standards. So the one year ACS was effectively canceled. There were a set of experimental estimates, but not something that we could use for metropolitan level fair market rents. So the other challenge that I alluded to was this volatility in the rental housing market. So this is the CPI rent of primary residence, the year over year change in rent. So as you can see, it's actually like crazy similar. If you look starting in 2005 through 2019, that at the national level, the average change in rent would have been just under 4% for each of those years. But then starting in 2020, you had this uh, pretty rapid decline and then an even sharper recovery where now we're, we're seeing the six to 7% year over year change in CPI rents of primary residence, which is uh, the highest it's been, I think going back to the early eighties, if you had a longer look at this graph. So that was uh, challenge two. And this uh, couple of graphs shows essentially the same thing, but compares the CPI rent of primary residence to two other sources of rent. Um, CoStar, which is a, a broad measure primarily of apartment rents and the CoreLogic single family um, rent measure. So you can see how during the course of COVID, CoStar estimates turned uh, sharply down, even, even sharper down than the CPI on the previous slide, where actually they were saw some negative growth during 2020. And as you might expect, the single family rental index showed uh, even higher growth because people were interested, more interested in renting single family homes, having more space. Uh, but then all the sources show this rapid recovery uh, after you get past that initial COVID downturn and get in closer to the present. So we've made two changes in the methodology, um, two broad changes, you know, each of these has like several moving, moving pieces, uh, but we've changed how we do that recent mover adjustment and we've changed how we do the inflation adjustment described here. So that was items two and three. So the big, uh, big overarching change is that we're introducing private rent data into the calculation for the first time. Um, there are a number of companies out there that produce various types of measures of market rent for each area. These estimates are of course, timelier than the ACS that has that uh, multi-year uh, difference between the current year and when the ACS estimates are available, but they're also timelier than the CPI, which is what HUD had, would have been using for its inflation adjustments previously, as I've said. And that's because of how the CPI is constructed where the entire sample does not get resurveyed each period. It's only a portion of it that gets resurveyed. And also that the fact that the CPI is a combination of in-place tenants and new movers, people who have new leases. Um, the broader research for this is that, you know, when you're in a, a more normal environment, when you have this stead steady rent growth, like we saw in the mid part of the decade, it doesn't matter which one you use because they are all ultimately measuring the same thing. But when you do have these inflection points, when you have a rapidly changing market, it is perhaps a little bit better to be bringing in some of these um, more, more current estimates that are looking at uh, asking rents or just a better measure of the rents faced by recent movers. So we've, we've HUD has long used these data in its, a, in its evaluation of rental, rental market conditions done by HUD's field economists that support FHA underwriting for multifamily properties. Uh, they were expanded in the PIH notice here listed here that expand that uh, gave the waiver for 120% payment standards. And uh, ultimately we've brought these into FY23 FMR calculation. So, uh, and this last bullet is pretty important. Um, we are only using this private rent data in areas where at least three out of six uh, total sources have coverage. So the minimum sources would be three, the maximum would be six of private companies. And um, that might sound like a lot having to have three, but that actually covers a huge chunk of the country because these three sources are, are um, 
you know, they're quite large companies, so they cover basically a lot of MSAs. So uh, some of this is reviewing what we've already talked about. The recent mover adjustment is meant to make rents as of 2020. So what did we do because we don't have that 2020 ACS data? Well, we've retained the use of the 2019 um, ACS one-year recent movie data. We've inflated it by this composite inflation factor that is made up of a weighted average of the private sources for areas that have private source coverage and the CPI rent of primary residence. The private sources gets a slightly larger weight at 60% than the CPI of 40%. We're continuing to use both because we think that looking at all these possible sources is the best representative sample of the entirety of the market because these private sources do not necessarily cover all types of units, whereas the CPI does cover all types of units. However, um, as we've said, because they can be more timely, we are giving them more weight overall. And that allows us to get a inflated 2019 recent mover factor. We take that average with the ACS 2020 five-year recent mover factor. Now that is different from, as I've said, the one-year recent mover factor because it would include survey respondents in 2020 and 2019. But because we, you know, that we wouldn't want to have be throwing out the 2020 data entirely because it is more recent than the ACS 2019 data, we do consider both and then ultimately take the average to get us the recent mover adjustment. So for that next step, the inflation adjustment, it's very similar to what we were using to inflate that 2019 estimate. It's uh, again, a weighted average of the private sources of data and the CPI rent of primary residence. And I shouldn't say that in, in, in each of those cases, the, the private sources and CPI rent give you a shelter rent change factor, which gets combined then with the CPI utility series to keep the inflation factor uh, uh, valid for the gross rent aspect of FMR, so a combination of rent and utilities. And in cases where the private rent data is not available, we continue to just use that CPI rent so it's essentially the same process, except that then in that case, the CPI rent would be 100% of the inflation factor. So this just puts it all together um, and restates that earlier slide that talks about the four steps of the FMR methodology. And this is an example for uh, Columbus, Ohio, which just happens to be where I'm from. Um, this table is from HUD's uh, online query tool, which we, which we call the documentation system that will walk the user through all of HUD's calculations here. Um, as you can see, like there's a lot of numbers as I've just been talking about each of these steps. I guess the, the important takeaway here is if you look at this middle slide, uh, you can see the, the weighted combination of the private sources and CPI for Columbus because Columbus is a big size metro, it's covered by private sources. Uh, that was coming in at a weighted average of 3.9% and 3.1%. So in this case, those are pretty similar. The resulting recent mover factors are 1.069 there at the bottom and 1.048. So again, those are pretty similar. There, there are cases where you know this would not be that similar, but it's just interesting to look at how these, these various sources track with each other. So this is just that step two, that recent mover adjustment. If you look at um, step three, again, it's the same idea here. We can see how in 2021, the private sources started to show that acceleration that we saw at the national level where the inflation coming from the private sources would be 6.8% versus 3% from the CPI. So that's how we ultimately come up with the inflation adjustment factor of almost 6% there. Um, I see I'm bump starting to bump up against my time, so I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little bit, but we do have this example here for Barber County, Alabama, which is a non-metro county, a smaller county that does not have private rent data. And you can see that the process is, is largely the same. It's just that that CPI gross rent change is the entirety of the inflation adjustment factor as opposed to that uh, composite of private data and the CPI. And same thing for step three, the inflation adjustment factor how it's just the same inflation adjustment factor that would have been used in the past. So uh, as Stephen said at the very outset, this has led, well, so let me be careful with my words here. The results of 
FY23 up the Mars are that the average FMR uh, has increased at about 10% for the two bedroom FMR. And this is uh, quite a bit larger than the typical 4% jump that we've seen starting in FY15 to, to FY2022. So, um, you know, because I've been talking about all these changes, you might think that this is a result of these changes. But actually, if you think about it, this graph ended up being pretty similar to what we saw with the CPI here. Um, and so what I would submit is that all these sources are ultimately measuring the same thing. They're measuring what we know to be true, which is that rents are going up very quickly in the market. So ultimately the increases in FMRs this year, I think are driven more by the actual underlying data themselves than by any sort of uh, technical tweaks by HUD. Um, you know, I think those changes have better captured local uh, experiences of the year-to-year -year change in rents because the private sector data is available for more uh, specific metro areas than the uh, CPI would be. Would be, but I think um, you know if you were to do the same sort of methodology year in year out, you might get different results depending on what is actually happening in the market. So this has the the average changes by HUD region. Uh, HUD region four, which is the southeast, had the highest. Uh, because of some, you know, really hot markets, particularly Atlanta, and these are weighted averages. So Atlanta is also being very large, helped pushed up the overall change. But there's there's quite high uh, uh, changes across all HUD regions. Um, again, just to stress, I recognize like because these are averages, like any specific market might be growing more slowly than the average, and that's definitely um, something that's important and important to keep in mind, the payment standard, payment standard flexibility is available to agencies, which I know the PIH team is gonna get into, but this is just some uh, some interesting results from the numbers themselves. And this is the uh, market specific look at some year to year changes for markets that had the largest percentage change. So uh, skipping back to how this process actually played out, we put out the notice that described how HUD was intending to change its methodology in July. Uh, we received 67 comments in response to that notice, which is a decent amount of comments, but it's not the all-time record, which was 370 comments way back in 2005 FMRs. I think, um, you know, it was the summer, so might not, not have been the, the best time to get it out there, but, uh, you know, that's what, what we had to do in order to accommodate the schedule of producing 23 FMRs. Um, there was, general support for our methodology, but uh, it was a little bit mixed. And I think that was in part by not necessarily having uh, all of these details in place to be able to see um, what we were actually talking about here. And so that is something that is, you know, still available for comment with the actual FMRs that are out there now, the comment period runs through the end of September. So it is, it is very much appropriate and we would encourage people to uh, submit comments on what they think of the actual uh, the actual methodology that HUD has adopted here. So now one thing to stress is um, that this is just the methodology for 2023. And that is because we expect to have the regular ACS 2021 available next year. So all of these, so these tweaks to the recent mover adjustment factor would no longer be necessary. Now that doesn't preclude us from adopting some aspects of this methodology change into the future, but we haven't made any decisions in that regard. Um, you know, and we would want to be to, what we would want to be thoughtful about what we ultimately come up with for FY 2024. So again, if you have thoughts about the long-term future of the methodology, you can you can um, please share those with HUD and have your 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 thoughts captured in, in the public record. So where do you do that? Uh, this link here is to the, the FY23 FMR notice that includes the comment tool. And as I said, there's about nine, nine days left to do that and get your comments in. And as always, for general questions or comments, that's the, the, the uh, email address for my division, pprd at hud.gov. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Rice from PIH, who I saw just came on camera there. So um, I guess take it away, Doug. Hi everyone, so I'm Doug Rice. I'm a special policy advisor in the Office of Public and Indian Housing. Um, so, you know, when the, when the 2022 FMRs were released, we almost immediately 
heard reports from around the country that they were very much out of sync with the sharply rising rents that many local markets were experiencing, which was making it much more difficult for families to lease vouchers at a time when rental vacancy rates had fallen to historic lows. But we're confident that the 2023 FMRs much more accurately reflect market conditions, which creates a real opportunity for PHAs to take steps to make it easier for families to lease up, access additional units and neighborhoods where they want to live, and generally to improve their utilization. But for this to happen, PHAs must promptly evaluate and adjust their payment standards to ensure that families do have access to a sufficiently wide range of housing options. And in fact, if PHAs want to do this, they have to act fairly quickly. The new FMRs are effective October 1, and under the regulations, PHAs must adjust their payment standards to reflect those new FMRs within three months of that date. And so it's important that PHAs move quickly here. And of course, as almost all of you know, so long as the payment standard is between 90 and 100 percent, 110 percent of the FMR, PHAs can set them anywhere within that range without HUD approval. This evaluating and updating payment standards to reflect market rent trends is not only good for families, helps them lease up, but it also has an impact on PHAs funding. For most PHAs, their annual renewal funding is based on their actual spending in the prior calendar year adjusted for inflation and other factors. The more a PHA spends in one year, the higher their renewal eligibility for the following year as a result. In recent history, just a point here, a lot of housing authorities seem to worry about the availability of renewal funding in the next year. And there's certainly always some measure of uncertainty about that. But recent history shows that housing voucher renewal funding is very reliable. In fact, in 15 of the last 17 years, housing authorities have received at or close to 100 percent of their renewal funding eligibility. So they can generally count on that. And I'll just add, while Congress has not yet approved a final appropriation for fiscal year 2023, we have reason to believe that renewal funding is very likely to be adequate next year, too. Okay. So we expect the new FMRs to be a significant improvement. But what if, nevertheless, local rents in your area are still well above the 2023 FMRs? Well, PHAs, of course, have many options to adjust. And just some of them are listed here. Most of you are familiar with these, but just to review them quickly. First, there are success rate payment standards. So PHAs can request approval from the HUD field office to base their payment standards on the 50th percentile of the fair market rent, rather than the standard 40th percentile FMR, if they're able to demonstrate that higher rents, rent levels are needed to ensure that voucher holders can successfully lease in local markets. And there's several conditions that PHAs have to meet to demonstrate that. But with some planning, these conditions are fairly straightforward for housing authorities to meet. So that's always one option. PHAs can also accept exception payment standards based on the small area fair market rent, which are rather than a metro area fair market rent. These are fair market rents based on individual zip code areas. 
And they can set small area fair market rents either for their entire jurisdiction uh, or for only particular zip codes. And because small area fair market rents are higher than FMR for some zip codes, this um, enables PHA to set higher payment standards in those areas and, and helps family, families lease up in, in zip code areas where rents are a little a bit higher than, than the metro averages. Um, PHAs can also request payment standard, general payment standard waivers from HUD. Um, and in fact, uh, HUD recently made this even easier than usual. Um, PIH notice 2022-9 provided housing authorities with the ability to seek expedited waivers to increase their payment standards up to 120% of the fair market rent. Uh, generally, uh, the current notice is set to expire on December 31st, but uh, we are planning and hope that this, the, a, a new notice will be uh, posted today, tomorrow, but in any case, very soon, that will extend that waiver authority uh, through 2023. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, so, managing your programs uh, generally, uh, I mean, there's no doubt that the voucher program is very complex. Markets are, are unusually volatile right now, which creates real challenges for housing authorities, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, and successfully managing a program, and this, especially in this kind of environment, requires an attentive evaluation of, of program performance management of, of housing authority uh, resources, including staff resources. Uh, so this includes carefully tracking uh, families' leasing success rates, families' rent burdens for those who are already leased, um, how successfully families are accessing units in higher rent areas in the PHA's jurisdiction as well as lower rent areas. Um, and then, of course, uh, analyzing these trends and making regular adjustments uh, to payment standards as well as subsidy standards, and importantly, uh, to the extent that housing authorities are able to, shifting staff as necessary uh, to, to, to make adjustments. So to ramp up voucher issuances, if that's uh, important to, to lease more units in the current market. Uh, perform inspections on a more timely basis, uh, expand, strengthen housing search assistance for families, provide better customer service to landlords. These are all potentially useful uh, ways to make use of staffing um, and so making adjustments to shift resources between these activities can help too. Uh, in addition, we encourage housing authorities to take advantage of other flexibilities that HUD has provided. Uh, Recently, and that was in PIH notice 2022-18, um, HUD uh, notified housing authorities that they may use admin fees to pay for security deposits for families, which can help is, is for a lot of families a, a major barrier to, to successfully leasing units, or to make landlord incentive payments as well to encourage landlords to um, participate in the program or or to, to retain them if they're already leasing some units to voucher tenants. And of course, housing authorities can always reach out to the HUD field office for technical assistance, uh, both on tracking program performance and uh, to discuss strategies to improve performance. In addition, HUD is, has uh, many tools to help housing authorities to improve uh, their utilization and I am now going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Patrick Hatch, who is going to walk you through a few of those tools. Patrick? So we're going to talk about the definition of the word esteemed, but I do appreciate it. Uh, so we kind of wanted to just sort of wrap up, certainly leaving time for questions, with uh, taking a lot of this information and pulling it into something that you guys uh, have seen and are a little bit more familiar with, and you can play through the effects um, of some of these changes on your program specifically. So we have uh, a page here that allows you to take a look and see 
uh, where you can find a couple of these tools. Uh, I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with them, um, but you can see there, we are going to take a quick second, talk about the payment standard tool, and we're going to uh, also jump into and talk a little bit about the two-year tool and how the change in the FMRs sort of allow us uh, and the resulting change in the payment standards. Um, and we can use that information to help you make the decisions on what you want to do with your program and then the effects of those decisions on things like the per unit cost. We could we progress the slide one possibly. Thank you. So this is the payment standard tool. Like I said, we're gonna keep this relatively short. Uh, many of you know I can drone on, but the key here, right, is to get an understanding of what this means for you. So whether that means you are you look, taking a look to see what happens if you have one payment standard area, or if you've got a couple, or if you've got all kinds of payment standard areas, this will allow you to plug that information in specifically to your program, take a look at the families uh, specifically, again, in your program, and see what the resultant change would be from changing that payment standard. So whether that payment standard is going to jump because of FMRs, whether it's going to jump because of uh, you increasing the payment standard, going to 105, going from 105 to 110, or using some of these waiver options that we talked about, maybe going even higher than that, 120%, or using the 50th percentile with the success rate. All of those can sort of be baked into here to allow you to say, okay, if I make this change, what's it going to mean for my program on two pieces, right? One, on the left, you can see what that's going to do to participant rent burden by bedroom size. So if you're raising your payment standards, right, uh, that is going to mean, broadly speaking, that, that you, the housing authority, is going to pay more of that rent while the family is going to pay less. So the rent burden for those where uh, the relationship between the payment standard and the gross rent fits they're going to see a drop in that rent burden, which is good, right? Flip side of it, who's paying more of that? That would be you guys, of course, right? So your your HAP is going to increase, and that's going to increase um, as those re-exams occur at the higher payment standard, or if you're potentially making use of another waiver that I don't think we talked about, but one that allows you to implement that payment standard basically immediately rather than at the next re-exam, you can see on the bottom right there in green, it's going to show you the per unit cost change per month as that new payment standard takes effect. So if you were implementing it all at once, we can certainly talk, you can talk to your field office, drop me a note, we can sort of discuss on what that would mean if you wanted to implement it all at once, how to pull that together. But that kind of allows us to see the two pieces, right? How much is it going to cost you to do this? And what does that mean for the families in your program? I would also just note that increasing the payment standard uh, sort of has two benefits, right? It has certainly this benefit of allowing um, a drop in the rent burden for the families, which is certainly a big objective of the program. But it would also allow you to, and it, this wouldn't be picked up in the payment standard tool, it would allow the families to have sort of more options for uh, the ability to find housing with that initial 40% cap, right? So if they've got a higher payment standard, it might allow them to get into areas they couldn't before which would then allow hopefully some upward pressure on your success rate, right? So you're more likely to have families leasing up than um, uh, potentially at a lower payment standard. So there's that benefit too that's not picked up in the tool, but we just wanted to quickly highlight that. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to just put this very simple slide here and sort of frame up uh, a little bit. You might recall this from last year. You see this um, in the tools today, but over here there on the right, you'll see there's a little section that says estimated 2022, right, last year, inflation. This is not yet in the tool. We're hoping to put this in in the next month or so, so that we can kind of get a better idea what the funding for the second year is going to look like. As my esteemed colleague Doug talked about, right, a lot of this sort of fits together, right? So, how much Congress appropriates affects how much the proration would be, right? Because it's based on how much you guys spent last year. So if there is a proration, which as noted, uh, we usually are able to get pretty close to 100%, HUD would then maybe potentially do an offset 
right? So pull money from housing authorities that don't seem to be spending it in order to increase that proration. And then on top of that proration, we're going to add your inflation factors, right? And as discussed, the FMRs this year, upon which the inflation factors are largely based, saw big jumps, right? It's of course PHA specific, but, uh, but you saw some of the, there was a chart that showed the, the biggest ones, but a lot of people have had uh, jumps that are going to be outside of the range of what we've seen in prior years, which means the inflation factor that sort of follows along with those FMRs is also going to be pretty big. So the kind of question and the reason we're waiting a little bit is hopefully to try and get a little bit better information on what this means for funding, because it would affect our proration. But I just wanted to, and we'll put a little bit more information and sort of talk through this when we put it into the tool. But I just wanted to make you guys aware that the default in the tool right now is 100% proration, right? But there is no inflation factor baked in. So if your FMR has jumped 10%, you're going to get probably in the range of, you know, an 8 to 10% inflation factor jump. So that's really important to keep in mind, particularly at this time of year, we just have a few months left in the calendar year and you're starting to sort of look forward on what you can do as we talked about with payment standards, as well as leasing additional units. What kind of funding are you going to have in 2023? Which is a big question mark, but you, we have got a pretty good feel for what those inflation factors are gonna be. And it's just really important that you guys keep those in mind as you're making plans for the following year, in particular on what you can do on the payment standard front and issuing and leasing up uh, new families. We go to the next slide. There is one thing I also just quickly wanted to point out that we touched on on the small area FMR piece. There's a part in the tool, and I've got an example up here that shows uh, this is this is um, uh, Twin Rivers, so just an example, and this is on the puck.rb tab, but it will allow you to see for your particular program the number of areas that are in an area that has a small area FMR, basically, and then the percent of your leased units that are in there, and then sort of drilling down a little bit more, it allows you to see basically what percent of your program is in a small area FMR area where the small area FMR is larger than the FMR. So if you're looking to reach that payment standard higher, one of the options, right, is to opt into using smaller FMRs. Even if you just wanna use it for one zip code, that's totally fine. So if you wanna reach payment standards higher in areas that um, have a smaller FMR, and that smaller FMR is higher than what you're using for the FMR, this allows you to see what areas those are and approximately what percent of your program are there. So if you take a look and you can see, it might be a little bit small, but there's a column that says, is the smaller FMR larger? Yes, than the FMR. So maybe that's an area we want to examine to see if we wanted to jump into using that particular zip codes, small area FMR. Because of 110%, if you will, of a higher number, it's gonna be a higher number than if you used 110% of the FMR. Advantage, right? Drive down rent burden, of course, but some of these areas too, you might not have a lot of families and that could well be because they can't at a, at a move or admission into the program, they can't get into that area because of the 40% initial cap, right, of uh, what they pay of their income towards rent. So you may still want to expand in areas where you don't have a lot of people to try and increase access to areas with higher opportunity and lower poverty, um, which is another sort of objective of our tenant-based program here. So we just wanted to touch on that. That's in the tool. It's one of the options, though, I just sort of reach higher with the payment standards. We're going to, I think the utilization call we're, we're going to do next month, uh, we're going to dive into the tools a little bit more, try and look at some examples. So um, that's up um, on the site if you guys want to, but we just wanted to spend a few minutes today trying to take sort of all this information and allow you to see how it translates into your particular program and the tools that we have that allow you to do that. So if we could flip to the next slide. I think I will hand it off to, uh, the highly esteemed Chad Rubel. Thank you for that, Patrick. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we do have a lot of resources on this area. Uh, our, our HCV utilization webinars are one of the top ones. Uh, and last month we had one on rent reasonableness. If you haven't seen that one, would really encourage it. There's obviously a connection there with setting payment standards. We also have the payment standard chapter of the HCV guidebook.
as well as the number of short videos um, over the course of the summer, we've been creating this HCV overview video series. Um, and it's available at www.hud.gov backslash HCV. Uh, there's a number of them that really connect with what we're talking about here. And so uh, if you just want a refresher, how uh, FMRs impact your HCV program, I think these short videos are a good way to go. And then as Stephen mentioned earlier, we do want to take some chats, uh, questions from the chat. And so if you haven't had a chance to uh, enter any questions you have, please uh, type them in now. We're going to do our best to try to get through what we can during the short bit of time we have left in the, in the webinar today. And I'm going to start with one that I saw come in um, from uh, Tony Carter here, can HUD share the data they used uh, so that we can look more specifically at our areas to set payment standards? So Adam, can you take that one? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned, we have the private sector inflation factors that were used in FMR calculation on the documentation system tool. I don't think that's what you're asking because you want to get more granular than that in setting payment standards, but I thought I'd mention that again. Um, we cannot share the, all the data that we use from the private sources because it's proprietary. We actually buy it in four of the six company cases. That's how these companies make their money. But what you could do is reach out to your field office or go through me and I can connect you with the PDNR field economist for your area. And if you tell them, hey, like here's the markets that we serve, here's what payment standards we're thinking about, where does that put us, like, or should we be going higher or lower? They could look at this data on the HUD side behind the scenes and probably advise you in that payment standard setting process, which might be of some help. All right, I've got another question here in the chat from Melinda. It says, since we were approved for an expedited pandemic waiver to use 120% of the 100, uh, 2022 small area FMR, would we continue to utilize the 120% to apply to this uh, 2023 FMR? And we have a special guest who helped us with the expedited payment standards and uh, just a general payment standard expert here. Uh, Allison, do you mind taking that one? Sure, thanks, Chad. Um, and that's a really good question. So what this new notice um, is going to do that I think Doug mentioned in his um, his presentation. So HUD will be publishing a notice, hopefully today or tomorrow, that allows for PHAs to get an extension on using the 100 and or up to 120% waiver, and you could apply that to your FY 2023 FMR, so the information we're discussing today. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It's a very simple process to get that extension. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, to getting that notice to you all at, as soon as we can. Allison, I have another question for you. Does allowing 120% of FMR payment standards for a tenant with a disability mean the unit has to specifically address that disability? Sure. Um, so for the up to 120% payment standards that we're talking about today, the PHA would adopt um, a payment standard for its program. So you, in the case that we're talking about, you would not need to look at um, reasonable accommodation exception payment standards on an individual basis for the up to 120% because your whole program would have a payment standard of up to 120%. If the family then needed um, a payment standard higher than 120%, you would go through the reasonable accommodation exception payment standard process. And then I, I'm, uh, I know there's a number of questions coming in here quick. Patrick, I have one for you. Has the payment standard tool been updated? My PHAs have been unsuccessful with conducting a payment standard analysis because they keep getting the end of debug message. Oh, uh, people sometimes have issues loading the PIC data in, in particular uh, if they've got a lot of payment standard areas, but it seems to be going okay uh, from everything I've heard. Clearly not now, so send me a note and we'll take a look and figure out what the problem is. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Allison, can you change to 120% payment standard if you had been using 105% payment standard? So the short answer is yes. You uh, can go up to 120% if you've been at 105%, but you'll just want to make sure that 
you have an approved waiver to go up to 120% or you have your waiver extended under this new notice. All right, thanks. Um, all right, so I apologize if you haven't gotten a question in here, uh, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to just a little bit of a wrap up um, for reminders for everybody, uh, we're really trying our best to, to make sure that this, and we know that there, you guys are dealing with a lot and uh, this is a complicated program to administer, right? And so we're trying to make sure the guidance is available. I uh, appreciate Adam for coming on the call today and talking through the FMRs. And uh, we have other resources uh, that hopefully you're taking advantage of. As Stephen mentioned, we have uh, the HCV Connect newsletter. It's the best way to stay on top of program reminders, guidance, webinars, other events. Uh, we have this HCV utilization webinar series. And so we have actually, you know, November 9th, as Doug referenced, uh, we covered this uh, sort of in more detail, just how the payment standard process works, exception payment standards and small area FMRs. And so if you haven't seen that webinar, you can go back, it's available on our website, as well as all the other topics we've done, right? So please uh, take advantage of these webinars. And if you have other thoughts for topics that would be helpful to you, like please let us know, we really want these to be um, you know, the best resource for you all and address your needs in administering the program. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we still have this HCV overview video series. This is really intended to just help give you in really short um, increments, like the, the basics of some of these key program levers that help you really utilize the program funds. FMR is obviously being a key one of those. So if you haven't seen that, please check it out. Um, and as always, we still have the uh, HCV utilization tools, the HCV data dashboard that's available, all accessible there at uh, hud.gov backslash HCV. So it's sort of a, a one-stop shop now for you to get to that information. Um, and then as Patrick mentioned, our next topic is really going to dive in to the, the tools that um, we maintain on the HUD side to help you really take advantage of all the HCV funding you get. Um, so if you haven't yet registered, now's a great time to do it. Uh, Wednesday, October 12th, we're going to have another one of these HCV utilization webinars where it's really going to be a deep dive into those tools um, and give you a chance. If you even want to have your uh, PHA pre previewed there, I think Patrick is looking for uh, PHA is willing to be an example, a housing authority. So please uh, consider registering. And thanks for everyone who uh, presented today and participated in the call. That concludes our conference. You may now disconnect.